I'd like to welcome you all to uh, winter semester of control seminars. We're back in our original pre COVID room, so let's fill it up. Um, if we run out of cookies, we'll order more next week. Um, and I'd like to um, welcome today one of the new members of our control faculty, Lisa Lee. She comes to us from Caltech, and before that, she was from Toronto, so she was not a snowflake, I guess. And uh, um, so her she's been here since she started in September. Um, we'll also have several other uh, assistant professors in control give seminars this semester. So this is going to be a really great way to meet all the younger people in the college. And um, with that, I will let Lisa tell her about her work. All right. So um, thank you, everyone, for coming. So as the title suggests, we're going to be talking about control theory for a rather unique application as a modeling tool for animals. So since this is kind of not an area everyone is familiar with, I want to give a quick background about control theory and sensory motor neuroscience. So how animals use their sensory information, be it vision, be it touch, um, electric waves, you know, hearing, Whatever sensory uh, modalities are available to animals, they use that information to inform their movements. And control theory, particularly uh, PID, LQR, and LQG, so very simple controllers are capable of explaining various biomechanical phenomena across many different uh, behaviors and many different animals. So when I say biomechanical phenomena, what I mean specifically are things like limb trajectories. So if you're reaching for a task, the trajectory of your hand, joint torques, again, the torques experienced by your arms or legs as you're you know, walking or reaching or doing something else, interaction forces, if you're in contact with the surface or muscle activations, things you can observe from the animal without taking the animal apart or going through very advanced imaging. Uh, behavioral context. So control models, specifically PID, LQR, and LQG, have been used for models involving flight, involving walking with different numbers of legs. So we have bipeds, quadrupeds, hexapods, reaching and balancing. And the animals, these are this is just a very short list, but the animals include humans, bats, salamanders, fruit flies, and so on. So it's a very diverse set of phenomena that the general idea of feedback control is able to help explain. Oh, one last thing I wanted to add. For one of these models, I think it is not even a PID controller, it is just a PD controller. So really you can get away with very, very simple uh, models. So the main, I see two main benefits of control theory as a modeling tool, as opposed to other types of tools. One very nice benefit is that control theory is highly human interpretable. We make a controller and we know exactly what the controller is doing, why it's doing it, what signals are going on through it. There's very little um, that we don't understand once we've made a controller. The other benefit is that control theory is fundamentally kind of like a closed loop, right? From sensory to computation to motor and then to environmental dynamics. It encompasses quite a lot of aspects of sensory motor control that are often studied separately. For example, biomechanics, which is kind of on the motor end versus neural control, the computation that goes on in our brains. These are typically studied by different parts of bio, like biology and experimentalists for good reason. But control theory is a nice kind of unifying framework that brings all of these together in one closed loop. But along with the benefits come with some challenges. So I've included here two, uh, two diagrams of what you could try to frame biological sensory motor control as in terms of a controller and a plant. On one hand, you can think of the brain as the controller and the body as the plant. The body has some intrinsic dynamics, right? And the brain is what we typically think of as doing computation. <laughs> you could also think of the animal itself as a controller. It interacts with the environment, right? You react to environmental happening, not just things happening on your own body. So these are both valid and these have both been used in models, but the general idea of how to frame any given system as a controller and a plant is usually a lot of work. In fact, in this area, I would say that's most of the work, framing the problem and then solving the problem. 
sometimes is even trivial. So unlike some of the problems we're used to where we pose the problem, we spend a lot of time figuring out the math. Here you pose the correct problem, it takes forever, and then you just apply a PI controller and you can get some results. Okay. And of course, any of the challenges that uh, anyone that works in interdisciplinary sciences can appreciate, you're translating between different areas of science that don't necessarily talk to each other. You're trying to talk about control theory to people who've never taken control theory or even heard of maybe control theory. And that's part of the reason why most of the models in uh, neuroscience are using these very simple, easy to understand control methods. Okay, so how might we actually use control theory in like a workflow? So this is one way that you could do it. You start with some dynamical system. Maybe you're modeling an arm, so you have some arm dynamics, right? Maybe you're modeling flight, you have some flapping dynamics. And then you have some specs for your controller design. So you have roughly speaking, objectives and constraints. What is the motor task trying to accomplish? And then once you have that, as I said, that's sometimes a difficult part. Once you have that, you just use whatever controller design technique you would like. Every, every almost, I think everyone here, even the students can do controller design, right? You can do a simple PID controller, you can do LQR controller, and then you can have your controller with your dynamical system, and then you can simulate the state of interest, for example, the torques, the trajectory, or whatever you're trying to study. Okay, that's the control side. From the neuro side, someone, maybe your collaborator, has an organism and they've done some experiments on it. Maybe they had a person in the lab, they try to get them to reach something. Maybe they had, I don't know, mice in the lab and they try to get them to balance. So whatever the experiment, in the end, we try to validate our model by comparing these two. Now, if you're really, really good and really, really lucky, and your model is so good, these two things will match up exactly. But typically speaking, there will be a degree of parameter tuning required. For example, if you are doing something like LQR, like optimal control, and you know that the goal of your organism is to, let's say, achieve the task, but also conserve energy while doing it. So often biology will have these like multi-objective, multi-constraint. Let's say you know those two objectives, but well, what's the exact numerical ratio between them, right? So that's something that you could use the experiment to tune for the parameters. Now, the benefit here is also the curse, right? The benefit of control theory is that it's pretty human interpretable. It doesn't have that many parameters for you to tune. So you better hope that you bring the thing at least correct enough that you can get close enough uh, to the experiment. Now, so here we're comparing only the outputs of the system. And that's why I'm calling it behavioral biomechanical modeling. But there's a second thing we could do, uh, which is kind of the focus of my research, is let's say that these two things match up, and they do in a variety of contexts. So that means your, your animal is, is, in some sense, being an optimal controller or being a PID controller. Your animal is acting as if it's a controller, Somewhere inside the animal, something is making it compute to behave like a controller, right? So how exactly is that going on? How is the controller being implemented? And that becomes a comparison between organism and your controller architecture or structure. So to that end, I'm gonna be talking about two projects today. One is distributed control and sensory motor internal feedback. And this is based on uh, ACC work from 2022 and a more recent PNAS work. So PNAS is the, the neural facing one and ACC is the controls facing one. I put distributed in quotes because while I won't get to be using, shall we say true distributed control, we'll be using some of the ideas from distributed control to help us make our model. Okay. So first I have to give a definition about internal feedback. And in a controller, be it uh, cyber physical, mathematical, or biological, we can think of internal feedback denoted by the pink arrow as information flow inside the controller from actuation towards sensing. So here we have a controller and a plant, right? Or an animal or an environment, whatever you want to think of your system as. So the fundamentals of control is that first, we sense something, then we do some kind of computation, then we act on the system, right? And then the system itself has some dynamics and then we do it all over again. 
So that's what we usually call feedback, right? When we say feedback control, we mean that loop from sensing to actuation and back again. That's what I'm gonna call external feedback. Internal feedback is information flow that goes the opposite way of what we might think to be useful, right? We're using sensory information to inform movement. You see something, you run away from it, something like that, right? But internal feedback is going the other way. Your movement is informing or doing something with your sensory information. So the, the reason that I came to be interested in this is because it is a very well-documented phenomena in vision. So um, here, it's kind of a similar diagram. Now we have body and environment as our plant and brain as our controller. So let's think about the pathway that vision takes, right? So first we have our eye, that's our sensor, and then our eye, feeds up to our uh, thalamus. So that's, so like if, you're, if your brain is like this, your thalamus is kind of in the middle. So it goes there and then it goes to cortex, V1, primary visual area, one of the most studied parts of the brain. And that roughly speaking, you can think of these three things as having like pixel type representations of your visual. So literally there's white here, there's green here. That's what you'll see. That's the type of infra that's getting passed up. Now, as you go farther into the pathway, you move from pixel representation to semantic representation. So instead of seeing the pixels, you start doing things like edge detection on V2 and V3, and then you start doing things like identifying the object itself. So roughly speaking, primitive processing, higher level definitions. Okay, it makes very much sense that we would use pixels to inform what the object is, but there's plenty of documented feedback in the pink arrows going from basically, let's say edge detection back towards pixel representation, right? So from higher levels processing to lower levels. Um, and even within each of the boxes, there's a lot of recurrence, recurrent processing as well. So uh, this has been kind of a mystery for a while and there's a number of explanations, but for us as a control theorist, we can very clearly see that basically half of the picture is missing, right? We're not just seeing for seeing's sake, we're seeing to, so that we can use that information to move. So let's add on the rest of the system, right? Which is the motor system. So you're familiar with this, this part already. What I've added are object motion, another higher level uh, semantic kind of processing area. And these two areas, MT and IT, they feed to motor cortex, which feeds to spinal cord, and that makes you move. And when you include these new sources or these new parts of the picture, there's actually even more internal feedback from now motor back towards vision. So there's lots of them. From the uh, motor side, there's basically one prevailing explanation of why the feedback is there, and it's the idea of efference copy, which means that you need to send a copy of your motor plans to your sensory plans for predictive purposes. So that's very verbal, not very quantitative. So let's try to do that with control. I've talked about three controllers. So let's look at them. Let's draw them out in this shape. First, we have the PID controller. You have some error signal. You split it into three, proportional integral derivative. You add them, you put them into your controller. You don't need any feedback. There is no backwards flow of information. Similarly in LQR, u equals kx. u equals kx, you don't need any recurrence or backwards feedback, okay, not good. But we have one more controller and that is LQG. And LQG in fact is the kind of the basis of the efference copy idea. So in LQG, let's assume that our system is a linear discrete time. So everything I draw is gonna be applicable to continuous time, but uh, you'll see later that discrete time is easier to work with for the things I'm trying to model. So discrete time, linear system, and then just the standard output feedback observer and controller. So if we take this very, very literally and draw it as lines carrying information and matrices being block operations, you get this. So three sources of feedback all are predictive. Remembering that the matrices A, B, and C live in the dynamical system, right? First, we have to develop our own models of the system, right? So we predict, we know the state right now. If we did nothing, how is the state going to evolve? That's the path through A, right? B is 
we know how our actions will affect the system, right? So we know the action we took, then how is the next uh, state gonna evolve? That's that top line. And that's basically exactly what efferents or efferents copy is. And the third one, we don't have direct sensing of states. We sense a transformation of the states, but we know what that transformation is. So what will we sense? Right? So it's all prediction and it's all prediction being used to compensate for the fact that we can't sense directly, basically. Okay, what about implementation? So it's not, I would say it's not very often that we draw this kind of thing in control theory, maybe only for pedagogy, because if we wanted to implement this, we would just type it into your code for your microcontroller and be done, right? You don't have to think about this, of where does the information go, right? What pathways are connecting, but the brain, is a bunch of very complicated pathways and we wanna to try to untangle that. So the brain does have to be implementing this in some way, right? So what, uh, is this a realistic way to implement the controller in the brain? That part of the brain is doing all of these things. So here, here I wanna introduce a new element, which is that uh, neurons are fundamentally very different from transistors in their computational and communication abilities. And one key part is that all animals have sensory motor delays. So I've borrowed this really nice diagram from this 2018 paper and we'll go through it together. So here they've said there's a total delay from sensory stimulus onset to muscle force peak of 30 milliseconds. This is for a circuit that goes from the leg to the spine and back down the leg. This doesn't even include neural processing, doesn't even include the brain, but we know that for lots of motor tasks, we do actually need to talk about the brain, right? So this is like a short delay. So first, the pink line. So the sensory delay, the time it takes for your sensor to react, takes a little bit of time, it's not a lot. Then your sensory nerve has to carry the information from your leg to your spine. That takes a portion of time. That's that purple chunk here. Then that nerve has to talk to the next nerve. So that little synapse, that takes a little bit of time. That's the orange line. And then your muscle nerve has to carry it all the way back down. So again, more delay. And then these last three blocks, the blue and the two green ones, are you have nerves carrying electrical signals. And then now you have to convert the electric signal into the mechanical signal that's going to make your muscle move. So there's some conversion time. And then your muscle takes a while to react. Your muscle is not instantaneous. It's going to take some time. So. If this involves the brain, you can imagine there's a lot more delay where that came from, right? You have to go up to the spinal cord, you have to go up to the brain, and the brain is not going to instantaneously compute for you, right? The brain is also going to have to do some processing, then it has to send it back down to your spine, so, you know, plus a number of milliseconds. As an organism point of reference, for fruit flies, the motor delay by itself is 30 milliseconds. So for humans, it's anything involving the brain is going to be at least... 60 or 100 milliseconds or more. Okay. okay, so we have sensory motor delays. Let's add them to our controller. So there's different ways to do it, but I've opted to go with the easiest one, which is LQR, state feedback, and we just wanna add one unit of motor delay. So what I've done here is, remember we had our nice U equals KX, Okay, but now I'm gonna say u equals kx, but after that, it takes a little while before you can actually act on the system. So I've decided to call that one x2. It's a little funky, but it allows us to massage the equations nicely. So our system has a true state of x1, and x2 is not actually a system state, it's the delayed actuation. And u is the intended actuation. We know what we're gonna do, but it's gonna take a little bit of time before the muscle does it. And if you stack the two states together, it lets you put the system into the form, the standard linear uh, equation. So then you can just put this into LQR directly. So this is not particularly hard, but the LQR part is even easier, right? So it goes back to what I said about formulating it is the trickier part. Doing the control is easy. Okay, so you throw that into MATLAB, do LQR, and then MATLAB gives you a matrix K, right? U equals KX. Now, we have x1 and x2, x1 being the state of the system, right? That's like the true state feedback component. 
Now X2 is your delayed actuation. So on the diagram to make X2 feedback to the addition sign, you have to relay your delayed motor plan back to your uh, kind of earlier area. So there's a little internal feedback. Okay, so that's the simplest math that we've come up with. It's one unit of delay, but obviously we wanna be able to do arbitrary units of delay, which you can. It's just more bookkeeping and you just add more and more of these things. Okay, so mathematically we're able to deal with this. Now, there's a problem with this and I don't know if any of you can immediately see it. Okay, I'll tell you. So remember the assumption that drove us to do this, right? We're assuming that like, let's say here is the, I don't know, nerve, and then this is the muscle, and we're saying that there's some units of delay in between them, right? If we could have made it faster, we would have, but we can't, which is why there's three units of delay. So then why is there a, a pink line through K4 that's instantaneously going from there to there, right? We're not kind of keeping consistent with our own assumptions. That's fine, we can just move them over. <laughs> Instead of making it travel all the way to the muscle before you do the feedback, you can just make some internal loops that carry either delayed information or if you wanna interpret it as such memory, right? So this type of thing, we usually don't look at in controls. It's not relevant to the input and output characteristics. But when we're thinking about things like neural systems where there has to be like physical locations for signals and such, this kind of thing is important. So that's something that I'm currently trying to work on is like formalizing something like this implementations of just normal controllers and the different ways you can do them and what constraints we have to consider while we're doing them. Because that matters a lot for biology, even if it doesn't matter so much for you know, engineers. Okay. We have sensory motor delay. I did motor delay. We can do sensor delay. It's basically the exact same thing. It's the dual problem. So um, for some reason, full control never gets taught in class, even though it's very easy to do with your knowledge. So state feedback is when the observation matrix C is equal to identity, right? So Y is equal to X and B can be whatever. Full control is when the actuation matrix B is identity and C can be whatever. So it's the dual of that. So you can set up the problem in an analogous way and it looks exactly the same. And then we also did a little simulation on a scalar case. So the scalar case, the task difficulty is just the stability of the system. So it's just the value of the, like x dot equals ax. Okay, so the lowest line is the baseline comparison. It's no delays. If you have no delays, you just have like u equals kx, you are done, it's very good, you behave very good. If you do have a delay, and you allow a compensatory signal like that, that's the pink line, you could do fine, it's not the best, but it's not the worst. Because the worst is if you make the system have a delay and you design it like that, but you prohibit that kind of feedback compensatory term, in the beginning it does fine, but as soon as you pass the, the stability, once you grow unstable, it gets worse and worse, and the dotted line is when you can't stabilize the system at all with a delayed system. So compensation is important for performance and also for stability. <laughs> okay, so to put the picture together, actually, let me go back a few slides because that picture is quite overwhelming. Okay, so remember that this is our vanilla LQG. It has the three feedback paths in blue through A, B, and C. So the three paths still remain through A, B, and C. All I've done is plugged in some sensor delays and motor delays. And actually, if you put the math in, it works out nicely that these things don't affect each other. So you add the sensor delay and it just creates its own little loop. It doesn't, there are in theory matrices that connect this to the rest of them, but they all turn out to be zero. So it's nice. The sensory delay, like you just need the local loop for the sensor delay. Similarly with motor. So this is LQG plus sensory motor delay. You can formulate it in the exact same way that I did before. It's a lot more bookkeeping, but it allows you to model the full sensory delay. Now, what this model, oh, and the other thing is if you're trying to do a reference tracking with this model, what you will also need is advanced knowledge of your trajectory uh, that is, so let's say you have 10 milliseconds of motor delay and you're trying to track a trajectory, you need to know the next 10 milliseconds of the trajectory that you need to track. 
right? Because by the time your action hits the system, it'll be 10 milliseconds in the future. So you need to know some future events. Now, this model doesn't include internal computation and communication delays. So I've included the motor and sensor delays based on the biology, but like, let's say the signal gets up to your brain, it's not gonna instantaneously come back down. So that is not included in this model. And so we decided to use a slightly different model for that. Okay, so this second case is a very, very, very simple version of uh, distributed control. So we assume two subsystems that are dynamically coupled to one another. It can be two, uh, two cities coupled by a power grid if you like, or in the case of us, it can be your hand and your elbow, for instance. These are dynamically coupled, but there's, uh, at least neurologically, there's evidence for local control of each of them. For example, in your uh, motor cortex, there's a place called hand knob, where if you poke this part of the hand knob, your hand will reliably do something. Okay, so there's some evidence for local control and local representations. And now what we're saying is, between these two local areas, let there be some communication, but let it be delayed because you can't just instantaneously go from one place in the brain to the next. Okay, so does this do anything? Well, we have the same simulation again here where the baseline is no delay. So no delays means that you basically have a centralized controller that instantaneously knows things about both the subsystems. Of course, it performs well. Okay, the second line, purple, or sorry, pink, that's with internal feedback. So you allow them to talk to each other, but with a little bit of delay, it performs you know, worse, but not so much worse. And then the third line is you have the local controller, you cannot speak to the other local controller, you must do everything purely locally. And as before, it diverges and then it cannot stabilize. But what's kind of interesting to me is that here, this is all unstable, right? It's all greater than one, which in the discrete regime is unstable, but actually there's, there's some part of it where the pink and the blue were quite overlapping, right? So if your system is not too unstable or if your task is not too hard, it's actually okay if you don't talk to the other controller. So it depends on your task. Translating this back to neuroscience is that there's kind of different ideas about motor cortex. One is homunculus and the other is whole body. So homunculus means literally, it means like tiny human. So there's a tiny human version of your body in various parts of the cortex. There's in motor, in somatosensory. And then you get papers that say the opposite. Hand knob area of cortex represents the whole body in a composition way, or motor signals for each arm are mixed across the hemispheres, yet partitioned. So it's 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 a mix, right? So are, so are they, is it a hand knob or is it not? Is, is it your whole body? And we have this tiny quantitative model that says, in some tasks, it's fine if you don't communicate with each other. It is just the hand knob. For some other tasks, highly dynamic tasks, for instance, you need to communicate with each other, otherwise the dynamic coupling will make you life kind of difficult, right? So we also have a version of this that's like true large scale distributed control, but this is the version from the neuroscience paper where we try to explain using the simplest possible map that we can. Okay, so I have three key takeaways for this part of the talk. The first is that simple controllers, again, PI, PID, LQR, can explain behaviors and physiology. The behaviors part that was established in literature, the physiology part, we try to make a little inroads on that with the little tweaks on LQR that we showed today. So you can change a little bit of theory and that'll let you make it match physiology much better. And when I say physiology, I mean neurophysiological constraints, delays in the sensor and the actuator everywhere in between. Okay, there's definitely a lot more work that needs to go on for that to be formalized. Uh, but we only gave like a few toy examples of that. And the last one, very, very important, implementation matters. So you can think of this as a kind of addition to realization theory. So we know that given a certain input output map, there's an infinite amount of ways to realize that in state space, right? But now we're saying not only do you have general state space, you have these constraints between, you're trying to match that to some you know, areas of brain or body. How does that constrain your implementation but you know, what are the spaces of implementations? How can we parameterize them? And then how can we match them to data? Okay, 
Uh, are there any questions about this half before I change gears and go into a completely different half? Yes. So, um, in the LPG example, uh, yeah. um, you said that the uh, uh, the internal feedbacks for the, the motor and the sensor uh, uh, components will be coupled. Yeah. Is that does that have to do a certain equivalence? Is is it true generally, or is it? Is it something that's happening specifically because of certain new equipment's in the QG? Hmm, that's a good question. I, I'm i not sure, but that's, that's very interesting. Other question, yes. In your results, it looked like you had error bars. What are the, what's the stochastic or vary, what's varying? I assume those are error bars, right? Uh, initial conditions, because this is no, so the, okay, so this problem is harder than the others in that it's not standard LQG at all. We made it small enough so we could hard code it. And then, so then we did have to do like uh, simulations over the range of initial conditions. Yeah. Okay. Well. She's my advice that she can go. Ahead. Okay. Then <laughs> 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 a quick question: Like usually these models, how do you validate them on like actual animals to know that this is their inner working? Sorry. How do we validate these models yeah. on animals? That's a good question. So. Um, Basically, if you wanted to validate this against an animal, you would have to start, um, because this is like a toy, each of the subsystem has a scalar dynamic, right? So if we wanted to model it against, for example, like an arm movement, we would have to make these subs of subsystems, sorry, bigger and match the arm dynamics. So there's, you know, models of that. And then, then we would try to develop, let's say, the internal pathways, right? The internal, like, structure of the controllers. But right now, I... My guess is that we don't have enough parameters in the model. Like right now, it's just me drawing diagrams and seeing how they can fit, but we don't have a formal kind of parameterized space of what could be going on inside. And the goal is once we have a parameterized kind of implementation space, that gives us something to better match with, let's say, like physiology that is known. Yeah. But the other problem is that you have to think about what parts of physiology are each of these one neuron, each of these 20 neurons, are populate millions of neurons. And then there's problems on the experimental side of what you would be calling like connections and so on. Okay, one one more, and then I'll go on. Oh, and then. So I I ask you also to think about the space of implementation. Yeah. Uh, what what type of I am imagining? I want to do, for example, implemented controller. I want to do multiplication and addition. Yeah. Uh, how many neurons I need to do multiplication and addition? Should I think about these implementations as? Uh, I have certain operations that can be implemented in the brain, and this implementation is just composition of those operators, or is it more spatial rather than the like? I think the main challenge currently is spatial because computationally, just at least evidence wise, like I'm sure populations of neurons are able to do basic computations, but I think the main challenge is the is the spatial thing because the, your computation has to get more predictive and kind of weirder if you start having delays everywhere. And then you also start having to be choosy about the, the information that you can send because they're encoding through spikes and things like that, right? It's not like they can just send a real number in, in this space. So then you, based on the construction of the axon, you might have to be choosing between like, I send this very, very accurately, but very slow, or I send this like in, encoded in two bits, but very, very fast, right? So that kind of thing I think is more relevant. Okay, and then we have time at the end for questions. So I will go on to the second part. So the second part, uh, we are gonna be comparing with an actual organism. We're gonna use the LQG sensory motor delay thing that I talked about. And the organism in question is Drosophila. So of course I did not do any of the experiments relating to this. That is my collaborating labs, uh, Tanoyo and Brunton labs at the University of Washington. Okay. So, Everyone always asks me, why are we studying fruit flies? I don't like fruit flies. They fly around in my house and they bother me, right? So fruit flies, along with other tiny insects that we might not like, they actually do very good robust locomotion, right? You probably have experienced this if you're trying to catch them. They're very good at evading things that might kill them. They have robust locomotion. And in, in terms of flies, uh, the interesting thing is that they spend most of their life walking. So. They are more tractable to study in terms of the number of neurons. We have advanced optogenetic and other types of genetic variations that we can do. 
Um, they've bred different strains of them for different specialties, okay, much more tractable than humans, both in terms of size and experimental technique and ethics. And from them, we hope to extract some principles of sensory motor control. So the fact that at the beginning of the talk, I talked about, you know, these simple controllers can model all kinds of behavior in all kinds of animals suggests that there's some commonality, right? There's some underlying principles that we can uncover. So we don't just want to know how the fly walks. We want to see if there's something we can learn that's more general. So for our specific model, we had three uh, goals. Firstly, we wanted to be able to produce realistic 3D joint kinematics. And um, that's facilitated by some of the experimental advances in that group. Second thing we wanted to do is be able to maintain a walking pattern under perturbations, right? It is kind of seldom that animals are walking in a, let's say, nominal setting. You're always walking on new terrain in different places. I mean, in this picture, the fly is on like something like a leaf or a grass, and that has to move and be slippery, and there's dewdrops, and okay. so probably it's going to be like perturbations entering into the walking. So it's important that we try to model that. And the last thing we wanted to do was explore tunable sensory motor delays. So one of the reasons we wanted to do that was from a scientific perspective, we're curious about what kind of drives sensory motor delays to sit at the location that they are. So why it's this delay and not that delay and not this other delay. The other thing is that in existing models, typically they either don't deal with delays because they're busy dealing with other aspects of the walking model, or they deal with delays, but as a fixed value. So the most, let's say, biologically accurate delays that I saw in models are the ones that they teach them how to walk. So um, I don't know if you have seen the, like it's a simulation and the model is trying to walk and trying to walk, it gets better and better. So those models often will have muscle delays encoded with them excellent. But then if you change the muscle delay, you have to train your model again. So it's not, not exactly tunable. So how do flies walk? Well, in terms of biological control, you can view them as being multi-layered, kind of like a human actually. So they have a brain of sorts, and then they have this thing called ventral nerve cord, which is essentially spine. It's their spine. And this spine connects to the different parts of the legs, the muscles of the legs and the proprioceptors of the legs, which sense uh, force and kind of spatial location or acceleration. And the muscles communicate with the nerve cord with a delay of about 30 milliseconds, sensory of about six to nine. And then they interact with the world through physics, limb mechanics, and so on. On the bottom right here is a schematic of the experiments that were carried out on the flies in, the, in these labs where they tethered a fly magnetically to a spherical treadmill and then rotated the spherical treadmill. It's just a tiny ball and the fly would walk and then using um, markerless pose estimation. So they would take videos of it. And then from the video, they would estimate the angles of the joints. So that's how we got the 3D kinematics. Here's an example of one of the joints moving with respect to time. Um, we have some multi-layered model. So the fly is kind of multi-layered in the biological arrangement. So we're like, okay, let's just do that, but in, in the model space. So for each leg, let's start from the bottom. So for each leg, we have a dynamics model. So it's like a link and joint, kind of a robotic arm model, if you will, but it's a leg. And then we used an optimal controller. So the exact LQG with sensory motor delay controller that I showed earlier to model control and also delays. And then we hook that up to a neural network. So this neural network takes all the data that they were able to get from the real flies and then try to copy how a fly walks essentially. And the optimal controller tries to track these biorealistic behaviors that the trajectory generator provides. And then finally, we get each leg to coordinate to each other leg from a Kuramoto oscillator which is a standard model of multi-legged coordination. So altogether, it looks like this. That's the spine, right? And then there's, for each leg, there's a little stack and they all coordinate with each other. Now, this is a, one nice thing about this is that it's very modular. So you can design the controller and dynamics without knowing anything about the Kuromoto oscillator and the neural net, which is what I did for this project. On the flip side, what my co-author did was you can design the Kuromoto oscillator and the trajectory generator without knowing anything about the optimal controller. And then at the end, you hook them up together. So 
in terms of model kinematics, we want to show that it you know, matches realistic kinematics. So here, all orange things are data from the fly, and all blue things are data simulated by the model. So we've included two specific joints, just as example joints. And you can see that kind of in shape and amplitude, there's some resemblance between the model and the data. The data is more noisy, right? It's kind of like more irregular, let's say. And the model is much, much more regular. And then to provide a better quantitative comparison, what we did was where we plotted the angle of the joint against the phase of walking. So whether you're in like down stance or up stance, and then you can see that there's a decent match. And then we did this, this time type of comparison for all six legs and all 30 joints. And then we just subtracted them. And the average difference is not too bad. So the average difference for all the joints across all the legs is about five to six, yeah, five to six degrees, which is on the same order as the measurement error denoted in the dotted line. So sometimes it's bad, as you can see by the spikes, but most of the time it actually walks relatively fine. Now, probably none of you are convinced that it walks fine from these plots, which is why we have videos, if it will load. Okay, that's not very good frame rate, but nonetheless, here are model and data. And yeah, I did not think about the zoom and the frame rate, rate interaction. But if we play long enough, I hope that you can agree that the qualitative appearance of the joints as they walk are relatively similar between the two. Um, the one on the right is a little bit more jittery. That's the data. And the one on the left, which is quite smooth, is the model. OK, it walks like a fly. Good. Next, we wanted to do uh, perturbations. So unfortunately, I didn't get videos for these on time, but I have the traces for you. So. We did perturbations to the legs, trying to imitate biorealistic things. Let's say you're walking, so let's pretend that this is the leg, and then you hit something slippery and then you like slip, right? So we did that through impulse and also persistent perturbations on specific joints of the legs. Um, during walking, so during the perturbation, so during that green part, they, they get kind of messy, but they still kind of try to retain the oscillatory behavior, and then afterwards they recover roughly. So actually, let me go back once. So we don't have the orange lines for this because we don't have the data for this. The fly walked in a nice unperturbed environment. We perturb our model, but we don't have the matching things for the data. So how do we do that comparison? And that's why we had uh, this process. I can see that I'm starting to approach the end. So I'm going to skip this. But in one sentence, it's just saying, given a certain trajectory for simulated walking, how similar is it to the data? So how, like how realistic is it? And you can have high values, which mean high similarity and low values, which mean low similarity. It looks weird. Okay, so that allowed us in conjunction with the sensory motor uh, things to do all these sweeps. So we'll go through these one at a time. So first of all, the color indicates the similarity measure that I described. A light color being high kinematic similarity, it walks good. So around, so the video that I showed you lies around, let's say one to 1.2 negative wise. Okay, so it looks good. And then low kinematic similarity, it's like this. It looks, well, obviously it's not correct. Okay, so starting from the very left, we have, let's look at just this one here. So on the X axis, we have perturbation strength. How strongly did we poke the fly? And on the Y axis, we have the motor delay. So if we pick one column, like for a fixed perturbation and look up, we can see that in, initially it's fine. And then as you increase the motor delay, it gets worse and worse. And this is, this makes sense. And then if you look at a row, like let's say you look at the motor delay equals 40 row, you can't quite reach that. But in the beginning, you have a good, good walking. And as you increase the perturbation, it also gets worse and worse. So these are both expected effects, right? And then in the white dotted line, that's the physiological value of motor delay. So it, it lies at this area where you walk okay for low perturbations and then kind of badly for high perturbations. So relative to biology, the perturbation strengths, the highest one is like the highest possible thing. If everything goes wrong, you walk on a floor with infinite frictional co uh, you know, coefficients and then you're very heavy and you hit it at the wrong angle and right, so, so but for most of, I would say, the, the more realistic perturbations, it looks fine in the biological range. 
And then the second plot here is forward speed. So we just decided to vary over forward speed. In this model, it doesn't make a huge difference to how well it walks. So this is for motor delay, where we fixed the sensory delay. For the next plot, the middle plot, we did the opposite. We fixed the motor delay, and we varied the sensory delay. And again, it's the same story. If you have more sensory delay for a fixed perturbation, you'll be worse. If you have more perturbation for a fixed delay, it'll be worse. And again, the physiological value of sensory delay falls kind of at the same place as the motor one, which is it walks decently for a range of you know lower perturbations and then it walks kind of strangely. It's interesting, it's not here, right? The, the physiological limit isn't that no matter what the perturbation is, I'll walk perfectly. And it's also not as soon as I have the smallest perturbation, I'll, I'll collapse, right? So you wanna be walking good for a range of smaller perturbations, but you don't wanna waste the metabolic energy to make super fast um, connections that have super low delay, but costs a lot of energy. And then that makes you walk perfectly in all perturbations, but you're not gonna encounter the worst perturbation you know, very often. So, And then the last thing that we did was because we could, we varied both delay and uh, both sensory and motor delay. And in this model, it doesn't matter what each of them is individually. It only matters what the sum, what the net delay is. So like, if you look at this corner where you have 40, 40 milliseconds of sensory delay and no motor delay, it's exactly the same as if you had 40 milliseconds of motor delay, but no sensory delay. So that's what's making this diagonal pattern. Now, part of this could be an artifact of the, you know, the way that we've modeled it using LQG. We, for example, we didn't assume any internal noise. But the other thing that's interesting is that in most animals, the motor delay is a lot bigger than the sensory delay. And from an evolutionary point of view, you could maybe say that electromechanical things necessarily have a larger time constant and that kind of squishes down the amount of time that's available for the sensory delay. Oh yeah, and these values are coming from these two papers. We did not just make them up. Okay, so some takeaways for the second half of this talk. The first one is that robust locomotion or basically continuing to walk even though there are perturbations, results in our model from a mix of pre-programmed behavior and control. So by pre-programmed in our model, I mean, we learn from data that's of basically nominal unperturbed walking, right? We didn't have to retrain it every time we added a perturbation, we just added a controller and it rejected the disturbances. This is something that we might think about for organism. Is that how they also move? Because it seems kind of unplausible that your organism is trained on every type of you know, ready for every type of perturbation and has a different mode for that. Perhaps it makes more sense that you have some kind of pre-programming and then you have something like reflexive controls to just reject whatever random disturbances you have. The second one is that the modularity of the architecture is what allowed us to do those sweeps in very little time. Because again, you can design the controller independently of the trajectory generator, which is the thing that takes the longest to train, you can just generate like 50 different delays, 50 different controllers, and it takes, I don't know, five minutes, right? LQG very fast to make. Um, and the modularity is actually not specific to this organism because many organisms have something like a central coordinator, has a brain, has a spine or you know nerve cord, and then they have some kind of distributed local control with delays in the middle. And if you have data on how they move, you could, in theory, train a net that models how they move and then add a controller at the bottom to try to reject those disturbances. So this is something that if anyone has data that they want to try this on, I think would be an interesting test. OK, and so these are the two examples that I have for you of uh, control for sensory motor neuroscience. And thank you all for being such a good audience. And I can take questions now. <laughs> Questions for our speaker? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have a question uh, about uh, the art way you use neural network to yeah. uh, simulate trajectories for the yeah. world, right? Yep. Um, I understand that there was a lot of data in neural network sort of learned the average trajectory for the Drosophila. 
And it made me think, uh, uh, is there actually some nice analytic expression that can explain the same dynamic? On average, is there some, you know, just law of... Oh, I see. Like, is there a, is there a, yeah. Yeah, just maybe, yeah. It just made me think of that. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, there are, I would say there are good models of the interleg coupling, and there are some models on the joint. But by the time you get to the joints, the problem is the thing that I talked about, like the video estimation, that's a relatively new technique that they've made. So before that, you can imagine the difficulty of attaching physical markers to a fly like to see what the joint angles are. So this is one of the earliest data sets that is so detailed with respect to the joints. So at a higher level, there are such models that we wouldn't have to use neural net, but at the detailed level, I don't think there's a lot of characterization on that yet. Yeah, Good, great question. Uh, in one of the slides you have mentioned regarding the physiological values. Uh, uh, yes, sorry, this one. How we arrived at those values for the sensory delays and motor delays? Like experimentally? They measured the, the time elapsed from the motor neuron spiking versus the muscle contracting. And then for sensory, something like parallel to that. So they hit it with a stimulus and saw how long it took the, the sensory neuron to spike. Yeah. Like uh, processing the data, right? Experimental data. Sorry. Uh, so you're asking how, how we know what the physiological values are, right? Yeah, that's, yeah, that, it's the method I described. Plus, plus a lot of processing probably, yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious about uh, the gains in the, these controllers that end up happening once you've done the LQR, the K values, I suppose. Uh, you know, when you write PIDs for like motors, so we have these high gain controllers that like immediately at, at like high frequency, the control thing. Yeah. Um, the gains that you use, like, are they like similarly? I, I don't know. So, ask this question, but like, is it like yeah. a high, stiff, high, stiff? Uh, behavior around the limb, or is it, um, you know, more floppy and? Uh... So in terms of the gains, what I can say is that having the delay makes so you have a delay, and then you have like both sensor and expected perturbations, and that makes the controller sort of less sure of itself because nothing it's doing is instantaneous. You're always acting on super old information, so yeah, it's not very stiff in that case. It's it's uh, I wouldn't say it's conservative, but it doesn't like immediately kill the disturbance. For example, yeah. Yep. So uh, it's kind of irregular, like how the shades go from origin to like uh, right top. So you get to like high high similarity not at the origin, but somewhere in the middle, uh, and uh, it goes down up again, and then goes down. Like, is there a good intuition to? So yeah, we made each of the squares by running uh, uh, five to six, I think, random simulations with random perturbations. But because the perturbations are random, and we generate them using um, like a Poisson process, it's it's also possible that some of the middle ones they just got unlucky in the number or the like nature of the perturbation. So we didn't run enough per each of these to be truly average, but this is like 250 sims, right? Times five. So the, yeah, we didn't run as many sims to get rid of the stochasticity. Good question. Yep. So let's say you're able to do biological experiments to test perturbations. How do you deal with the fact that the fly actually learns the perturbations? Mm, I'm not sure if it learns the perturbations perturbations, you could probably like continuously vary that to do it. The other thing is it's uncertain, depending on the mode of perturbation, it's not fully known whether it's doing like active adaptation or if you're just, you've just hit like a different regime of their like reflexive reaction in that case. So it's hard to say whether they're adapting. The, I, my impression was that people don't do perturbation uh, experiments because they're too hard to do. It's actually very hard to get the fly to just keep walking because plenty of the data has to be discarded because it just decides to stop. Or when we try to find the different forward speeds, I'm not the one that does this. I just hear this from the experimentalist, right? Um, which is why I'm not doing the experiments. But in the in the forward speed regime, um, especially for the lower speeds, we had some trouble with our data because all of them. So you you measure it for like 10 seconds and the average speed is this, but it turns out how the fly does it is it walks and then it stops and then it walks and then it stops. So it was very hard to find like continuous variation. So even for speeds, it's hard for perturbations. So I think it's way too hard. Yeah. Um, I had a question about the delays. So, yep. um, you know, when you have large delays, you've shown that like the way it walks is not kilometrically similar to like a nominal fly walking. Yeah, but is there any case where it actually fails like uh, in all these 
simulation that you did, is there a case, is there a threshold of either sensory delay or motor delay where like the fly will fundamentally just fall if you perturb it? Yeah, so the, the thing that I've abstracted away in this, this part is that most of the things we're doing were with kinematics because there was no good way to measure force for the fly walking. So most of the comparisons we do are also kinematically like okay. they're about kinematics. I would say falling, my guess is if we incorporated forces would be around like 1.6 maybe here. Like it looks weird enough that if you were including forces it would be falling okay. down, yeah. Um, can you say a little bit more about how you, uh, said something about magnetically getting the, <laughs> how do you do that in a way, you know, some metal backpack or whatever that doesn't change the dynamics that you're trying to study? That's a, that's a really good question. I actually don't know the answer. My impression is that magnetic tethering is actually the least, uh, shall we say, intrusive tethering compared to like mechanical tethering, which has obvious problems. Yeah. Yep. Sure as well. This is man was carried through by human walking. So this kind of modeling that they would the I think internalized the size of an animal. So yeah, because so again, this comes back to the force problem. So for hexapods, they're relatively stable, so we're more comfortable working with kinematics. But for bipeds, stability and dynamics is a key problem, right? Because bipeds are very, very unstable compared to hexapods. So I would, I think the dynamics would be much more complicated in that. I wouldn't be as comfortable using fully decoupled like models. Yeah, but like hexapods or like spiders, I think would be good. <laughs> Or like, um, yeah, let me think more. I think there's like other organisms that would be good for bypass, probably not. Yeah. Uh, there was a question in the back. Maybe one more question and then we'll, there's a chat question. Oh, there's a chat question, nice. Okay, cool. So uh, just wondering, so you use a neural network to kind of approximate the animal behavior policy, right? Yep. And that will be a, a, a module in this model. So yep. um, how does the accuracy of that neural network uh, affect this, uh, I mean, these viewers. So the neural network is the one that's responsible for like copying the data. The controller just does what the neural network does, tells it to do. So yeah, the act, the how well that net behaves is the ceiling of how well the model will behave. Because it's always possible that you have a really good neural net, it does great, and then your controller is bad, so it doesn't track it. But it's not possible that your neural net is bad, but your controller magically somehow makes it realistic again. So yeah, we're limited by how good the neural net is. And then should I look at the chat? Yeah. On robust locomotion, could, oh, sorry, could organisms be learning other than just pre programming behavior and control? Any ideas on how to account for this adaptation in the motor behavior during some tasks? So that's a good question. I think it's kind of similar to your question how, how to tell whether they're pre programming or not. Could they be learning? I think there's, you would have to be measuring their reaction to the perturbation, which I've described the challenges to. And then you would have to be able to quantify whether that is like adaptive, whether it's fundamentally changed something in them or whether it's just reflexive kind of continuation. So yeah, that's an interesting thing for my collaborators to explore maybe. You can also be switching out the plot. Sorry? You can keep switching out the plot to keep using a different plot. Oh yeah, of course they get tired of walking and stuff too. You have to let them, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Well, uh, thanks, Lisa. And then thanks. Serious. <laughs> 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 Oh no, it's fine. I mean, it's I exited already. Perfectly. I'll I'll ever respond to you. Thank you so much. They're coupled through the ground. So, yeah, yeah. so words question. I can also get the horses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I love that. Well, they're definitely all coupled. Right. Yeah. 
Oh, methods from this. Like sensing motor de delays, and we have like sensing motor delays. I think it means that the models which are very accurate of the world that's allowing us to do this robust. Now works are true. How, how did we get these models? How much learning? How did these models come from? I've looked at where it's like you can have more accurate range of this stuff. So if like from the spine is 30 milliseconds for an interval. Like a neuron, right? And I've looked into like more detailed models, but I think the problem is see that? too many. Of them. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Single neurons, for example. Yeah, uh, they have three weeks. Yeah, it's not going to trade. That's what we think. No, I'm just kidding. I am not teaching this. I'm going to do this. This is not a layer. This is not a layer. This is not a layer. Yeah, yeah. This is not a layer. At some point, it, it becomes more like a network. But before that, I think that those things are all over. Yeah. There's plenty of work actually. People trying to train neural networks for vision, and they say, "Here is the neural net. Here are the literal neurons, and here is how they compare." This is like the most popular. So this is usually something pretty fun thing to look at. Yeah. Sorry, I, I, I don't have more questions. <laughs> Uh, I was just asking you, I wanted to know if there was really the force on the bed and like the force resolution for the token, whatever it is. I don't know. Like that, there we go. Um, that would really, you know, to some degree for kinematics, so were you able to like kind of make a relationship with well, like, we, we tried pretty hard because we very much wanted to do like the force yes. thing, but it like it doesn't work very well when we try to do it. So we yeah. did. Because I was wondering, I like I did like a very similar thing where I was like taking um, data and modeling sort of graphs with different hands and stuff like that, and we're trying to compare the graphs with like and then watch so because based on like either perturbations or type of graphs or like how the leg specifically lands, then you're oh that's kind of which she has one she has a description. You can kind of like deal with perturbation better. Model like, like yeah. include the dynamical coupling across the lines as well. Yeah, we really wanted to that we like spend. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. Yeah, I'm on the on the other side of facing. So on the first one. On the back. Okay, cool. I mean, your time delay thing is really cool. But that's like more complex than other things. Yeah. Very complex. You can include delays, which is like super interesting. If you're training on human data as well, like you should definitely include delays. I think the graphs can get more interesting because I feel like there's more cognitive part of it. Oh, your computer problems. Okay. Yeah. Always go there. It's like, these are things that I, like walking, you don't think about walking very often. Grasping, I think, starts, like, the other parts of the brain suddenly starts jumping in and, like, modulating your movement or something like that. Yeah. Like, the more reflexive things, I think the delay is so little that it doesn't matter in a sense, but, like, like grasping. Okay. Yeah, so there's, uh, yeah, you need to I don't know, like everyone's trying to like create these like, yeah, the other persons you need to have like 10 ninja different hands and then yeah, you're like realizing you're training yeah, all, yeah, all yeah, of that yeah, massive yeah, amount of data. Yes, so yeah, you just need to do the massive model of the hand and you're like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you. It's really cool. Okay, okay. okay. So in the very end, I talk about whether we are the nature of the 
I feel like that's kind of related to like transfer learning or transfer. Well, you know, nobody is really actually. Not a similar, but it is very likely that there's. Yeah. I think it's so much. I think it's a really interesting thing. Yeah. I also heard it from the people talking about like, oh, animal control. That was like, it really thinking about like swarm control. Zero support by the now. I think the